So for a question that asks you on paper three um, about Japan at this sort of crucial time period, this sort of 1853, start of the Bakumatsu period to the Meiji Restoration, you need to be very clear really about what Japan was like before the arrival of Commodore Perry and this concept that comes through in a couple of the exam questions that you'll see that's asked about this time period, this idea that you know Perry kind of knocked on an open door or that the Tokugawa regime was already rotten before Perry arrived. So really before you get started on the impact of Perry, can you accurately and clearly describe some of the key aspects of life in Japan before Perry arrived? The social structure of Tokugawa Japan, with the merchant class languishing at the bottom despite the kind of huge um, entrepreneurial skills, they have no political power, daimyo remember up to their eyeballs in debt to merchants, they're running out of Osaka. All of those types of things for social changes, the kind of weakness now of this samurai class, no longer the kind of necessary military force they might have been 200 or 300 years earlier. Instead, many of them living in poverty, restricted by the sort of social constraints from going into business, you know, sort of spending their days writing poetry. We talked a little bit about the floating world and the kind of fantasy life that many Japanese lived in to kind of escape from the huge social constraints that many found themselves onward, uh, under and of course as ever the grinding poverty of peasants growing rice for taxation which they can't afford to eat so the so can you think about those social pressures and those social changes politically of course the Tokugawa shogunate runs Japan as a feudal system how does that work? Controlling the daimyo through Sankin Kotai, the alternate attendance system, and how they operate and run Japan. Japan's economy, of course, no outside trade with any other country other than the Dutch, very limited contact with neighbours, Korea and China, really very little going on in terms of economic development and of course the class that's generating the wealth, the merchant class, are the ones that are the bottom of the political pile and international relations, who are their friends. So by the early 1850s, Japan is all, you know, is in a very stale situation. You know, everything there might be beautiful, but it's an insular, pre-industrial, agrarian society. And money now and the generation of income is becoming more and more of an issue for Japan. Unlike China, Japan doesn't have that huge population boom that um, happens in the mid-19th century. Probably Japanese are practicing methods of birth control earlier than the Chinese and they were probably using um, selective infanticide to kind of control the size and structure of their families and perhaps in a perhaps there's a value more of material goods and material comfort than there is on the size of the family. But money is a central concern for the Japanese government at this time. They are increasingly insolvent and the shogunate daimyos are relying more and more on credit coming from the merchants. The problem is of this, of course, is that they're still taxing in rice, whereas a money business economy is developing. So there's lots of different situations and these merchants are getting wealthy and they're not paying tax in rice and they're not paying tax in money either because the economic bureaucracy hasn't kept up with the changing developments in the Japanese economy and it might even be worth thinking about the fact that because the merchants are kind of so out of the political loop that they're able to operate so freely. Um, there's a famine in the 1830s caused by poor harvest and there's an economic crisis because with a bad harvest, poor rice production, government revenue obviously is decreased and there's an increase in rural unrest. Um, by the 1840s, the shogunate introduced the Tenpo reforms designed to get Japan back to its Neo-Confucian ideals rather than to modernise. So again, always with Japan, these issues of reform, revolution, restoration, are the Tenpo reforms an attempt to, for progress or an attempt to kind of go back to a more idyllic time? The programme generally fails, but 
circumstances kind of help the shogun out in the fact that harvests do improve in the kind of mid to late 1840s. So we're back to you know, surviving the crisis through nothing other than an improved climate. And Japan is back to its kind of self-sufficient agrarianism and its kind of seclusion policy. So the crisis that might have come prior to Perry in the 1840s is averted because harvests improve. So as we've studied before, there's this Sakoku policy, this seclusion policy, and there's numbers of different things going on here with that. In the picture, you can see the island of Deshima is sometimes called Dejima. It's the same place. You can see both spellings on the slide there. Um, no travel abroad, no contact with foreigners. Remember some of those Western clans, in particular the Choshu and the Satsuma, are having some illegal contact with Westerners. But as a government policy, and certainly as something that's a big part of Japanese life, it's not there at all. So this very strictly controlled island of Deshima, this football pitch size, one place off, one place off, was where the Dutch could stay while they conducted their trading with Japan. It's just off um, the coast of Nagasaki. Um, no practicing of Christianity and really no Japanese are allowed to go to Dejima. A few Japanese scholars undertake the study of um, Western learning, um, but really it doesn't spread to the rest of Japan and by the 1840s was the, the kind of modern Western world is embracing steam power and electricity and railways. Japan is still obviously an agrarian society. So the contact with the West is very carefully managed. So in terms of Perry's interest, in terms of American interest in Japan, there's a lot going on here. And obviously... The shogun is looking with concern at events in China from 1842 onwards, the horrors of the Opium War and, of course, the resolutions with the Treaty of Nanjing. However cut off China, um, Japan might have been, that kind of news had travelled to Japan. So these colonial enclaves are being established in China and Really now Japan has to deal with this perceived and probably very real threat from the West and economic reforms seem to be the answer, although again they're not able to necessarily adjust the taxation system in a way that could help the government raise more capital and there's little interest, knowledge or foundation for any kind of development of an industrial base. Um, the USA tries in 1846, James Biddle arrives and gets nowhere after popping up in Edo Bay, but it's Perry, of course, in 1853 that will come later. And remember, the US is late on the scene when it comes to imperial development, not that any American at the time would admit this was imperialism, but Japan is available for the taking, um, and it's in a good strategic location. Of course, the big prize in Asia is China, but the United States is going to be moving in to a market where there's already lots of competition. So Japan provides an opportunity there. So Perry prepares very well for the mission. He studies hard. He kind of really tries to learn some of the cultural aspects. But he's, he's ready to meet a weak and barbarous people. It's his steamships that impress the Japanese, bellowing their black smoke as they turn up. Um, and he arrives and sort of drops off at Yokohama. There's this bizarre series of meetings where American wrestlers are presented and sumo wrestlers are presented. Um, and it's, it's all very kind of polite and strange. But Perry doesn't push the issue in 1853. He simply pre presents President Fillmore's letter to the Japanese and um, really, you know, stating very clearly that the Americans mean business and that he'll be back next year for their reply. So he kind of allows the Japanese plenty of time to sort of consider their position and what's going on. But what he does do then and what his arrival and the uh, um, giving the letter does is kind of create a huge period of the years long tension and anxiety in Japan at this time. So really now 
the whole policy of the shogun, of Sakoku, of seclusion, is under question and under pressure. And it brings about a huge debate in Japan to open the country, Kaikoku or Joy, to expel the barbarians. And really, this splits Japan. There's huge levels of debate and discussion about the whole thing. You know, and at the end of the day, Japan must not seem weak. Is it better to welcome the Westerners, try and learn from them and then push them out, or to try and keep them away? There's a feeling from this sort of joy group that, that open the country to the West would be a disaster, that the neo-Confucian social structure, which is already falling apart, would be in tatters by the time these contacts had happened. Merchants would get richer, samurai would get poorer, and it would be a disaster for Japanese-ness and the Japanese way of life. But the, those who were into the Kakoku, open the country, saw the advantages of the West and realised that Japan needed to get them too. And so this is the debate that kind of reigns in Japan at this time. In 1854, though, Perry comes back with a squad double in size. He's now got eight ships and the Japanese do all they can to delay and put him off. Lots of, you know... Typical, polite, diplomatic, delaying tactics, tea ceremonies and that type of thing. But eventually, the Japanese government decides that a treaty to go with opening the country is the only option for them. It's called the Kanagawa Treaty of Friendship. And from this point on, the shogunate concludes similar treaties with other Western countries as well. For the Japanese, it's often presented as the beginning of their set of unfair treaties and you can decide for yourselves how fair or unfair you think they are and have a look at some of the historians' opinions on that topic. Um, there's some good things and some bad things about the treaty. We've got opening up of ports. Remember, though, that the Americans kind of misfire perhaps with the American consul being based at Shimoda, perhaps not really understanding that the power lies with the shogun in Tokyo. So there's a couple of little things there, but generally that's how the treaty goes. It's well received in um, the US, of course, but less so in Japan, where, of course, it's seen as a sort of treasonous act by the Tokugawa shogun. Thanks for listening.